at Allegis Financial Partners, just give you a little bit of a history. Uh, we're, a, we're a division or, or we're a, uh, uh, a, a uh, marketing organization, if you will. Uh, and we're part of the One America family of companies that's based out of Indianapolis. Our broker dealer is One America Securities, and uh, we represent a wide range of financial products and planning concepts, uh, dealing with uh, mutual funds, uh, managed accounts, um, a variable and index annuities, long-term care products, life insurance. Uh, so pretty much anything that you can do financially, we can do it for you. And uh, most, of, uh, m most of the business that we do we, we write with the One America group of companies or we write it through their affiliate broker dealer. I probably have to say that to satisfy the compliance people if they ever watch this tape. Um, so good to be here with you. I'm from Boise. Uh, we have uh, in the Allegis system, we have offices in Portland, Vancouver uh, area, uh, Layton, Logan, Idaho Falls, Pocatello, uh, and over in Boise and Nampa. So we, uh, we tend to uh, make the rounds a little bit and and happy to have one of our representatives uh, with us today, uh, Jordan. So we're going to get started. Um, good presentation today. Franklin Templeton is is one of the the, the uh, well-known names in the investment business. They're a mutual fund provider, and they've provided us with our materials today for the discussion. Uh, investing 101 is the name of our class today. I'm going to just give you a high-level view of investing and talk to you a little bit about some things that you ought to be considering. I'm going to tweak it a little bit and make sure that I cover you know, based on age, um, this this is a little bit, uh, I think, younger crowd than we had, and certainly a better looking crowd than we had out at uh, the road and bridge uh, department this morning. Uh, and and you, you can replay this for them so they can, you know, give them a hard time. But uh, I understand road and bridge, those guys work hard and, and uh, they were up early this morning. Um, so our agenda today, we're going to talk about why we should invest. We're going to talk about investment banking. Uh, and I'm sorry, investment basics. We'll talk about mutual funds, a little bit about asset allocation and the importance of, of investing now and of staying investing. So why invest? Um, typically, people invest to spend, just not today. Typically, we have a purpose for our investment. We're going to put money somewhere and we're going to use it in the future. Maybe it's because we want to buy a house. Maybe we're getting uh, money set aside for little Johnny to go to school or little Sally and maybe we want to save for retirement. Um, sometimes there's other reasons that, that, that we might save, but typically we save and invest uh, so that we have money to spend at some point in the future. The power of compounding is incredible. This is a great slide, I love this. Um, who is our youngest person in the, in the audience? Let's pick on our youngest person. Might be here or it might be here. How old? Sorry, it's right here. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. How old are you? 27. 27 and you're 26? Yeah. Okay, good. 27, all right. She wins. Um, so um, if, we, uh, if, if, if you look at this chart, if you could scrounge up $10,000 and you could invest that in, the, in an index that tracked the S&P 500. Now, we can't invest directly in the S&P 500. But if you could invest in something similar, if history repeated itself, and it won't exactly, but, but, but generally it does, 50 years from now, you would have almost $1.3 million without adding anything to it, just, just letting it do its thing. That's the power of compounding over, over, over a long period of time. And, and we like to show that because time is your best friend when you're investing. Now, there's a couple of you, of you in here that are a little bit older. You might be getting closer to the retirement side. If that's the case, then your strategy might be a little bit different. But for those of you who are younger, let time be your friend. Let it work, and it'll do good things for you. The cost of waiting. I love this. Here's Mary's account of $314,000, and here's John's account of $244,000. Mary is a good saver. She understands the value of long-term investing. John is a spender. He likes to have a new pickup, likes to have a new snow machine, wants to go spend his money and hang out with his buddies. Mary says, nah, I'm going to save my money. So she started a little bit sooner. John invested 20 years longer and contributed an additional $40,000 over his working years, but his account is worth 22% less because he started 10 years later. So the idea of starting early 
and letting the market work is, is really in your best interest. Just a couple of basics. One of the things to keep in mind is that you need to let accounts in the investment world serve their purpose according to the time horizon that you have. So, for example, um, a CD is a really good investment for money that you want to spend in a year or two. It's not a good investment for money that's long term because it doesn't keep up with inflation. It doesn't earn enough. Right now, CDs, inflation adjusted, are, are earning a negative return. So money that you, that you look at and say, this is money that I'm going to use in 15 or 20 or 25 years, let the market work. Money that you're going to need in two months, keep it in your checking account or your savings account. Money you're going to need in two years, maybe a CD is the right approach. But generally speaking, if you have longer than three years, you probably should be in some kind of market-based or bond-based investment to maximize the return on those dollars. You'll notice there on that slide that since 2010, inflation, well, actually 2009, inflation-adjusted returns on CDs have been negative for seven years. And yet, there's a lot of people that keep money there because, quote, unquote, it's safe. Yes, it is safe, but when you consider that you're not earning much and the inflation uh, uh, adjustment on the dollar, you're actually losing. Inflation shrinks your buying power. There's no question about it. A stamp in 1996 was 32 cents. I can remember when, when stamps, uh, at one point in my life, I can remember stamps being a quarter. And, and, and now today, here we are, they're, they're 47 cents. Projected to be 72 cents by 2036 if we still have a post office. Uh, a gallon of milk was 273 in 1996, 329 today on average. A new car in 1996 was 18,000. Last year, 25, and by 2036, 39,000. We've seen the effects of inflation, right? Think about, um, let's just play a little game. Um, anybody in the group that bought a house prior to 1970? How about 1975? You did? Prior to 1975? 1980. Oh, come on. Somebody in here bought a house prior to 1980. 1985? Right there. How much did you pay for your first house? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? What, tell us about that house. Well, it was in Monticello, and it was an area that was wrecked. It was raining, and the industry had kind of fallen through there, so it was just used to it. Okay. $20,000 in 1985. Three bedroom, two bath? Three bedroom, one bath. What would a three bedroom, one bath, bath house cost today in Brigham City? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to get less than a hundred and a quarter, probably. Isn't that amazing? That's, that, that's, that's inflation at work. So, so it's important that your dollars that you're investing keep up with those changes, right? Otherwise, you're getting left behind. Thanks for sharing with us. Three main asset classes, uh, stocks, bonds, and, and money markets. We're going to talk about these briefly. Stocks offer the opportunity for capital appreciation. Long term, stocks are going to outperform any other investment. And here's the funny thing about it. If you're invested for the long term and you don't have to pull out for a short term need, stocks will almost always benefit you. But the problem is that we get in our own way, right? You're, if, if you're like my old man, you buy high all the time and sell low even more frequently. It's just the opposite of what we should do, right? But if you can discipline yourself to buy low, and sell high and position your finances in a way that 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 allows that to happen stocks will win um, you can see here a comparison uh, since 1996 uh, a ten thousand dollar investment in stocks uh, returned uh, uh, grew to forty four thousand dollars basically if you were in bonds you grew it to twenty eight thousand six month cd seventeen thousand and t bills fifteen thousand Notice the green line and the blue line. Notice that there was a period of time there uh, from 06 to about 11 where the green line was winning. Bonds, conservative, safe, low return, good for nothing bonds, beat stocks for five years. Well, you, some of you probably remember that five year period. I remember it because some of my clients were threatening to jump off bridges because they were, you know, their, their, their value was down. And, and so, this is a good example of 
one investment may not be the right thing at any given time, a balanced approach is probably more appropriate to take advantage of, of the highs, but also protect against the lows. Now, of course, in the last three years, we've seen stocks run rampant, right? Especially that last year and a half. If we, th if we showed this slide effective July 31st of this year, we'd be up another 17% on top of that number. So we've seen some good things here in the last little while in the market. The stock market, the best annual return over the last 20 years, ending in December 31st of last year, the best return was 33%. The best return in the bond market was 12. Well, so right away you'd say, well, I should be in, in stocks because that's the best. The problem is that you have to deal with the downside. The worst year was 37%, but that's a little bit misleading because there was actually a period of time where from for over a 12-month period that the market was down 55% in that 08 into 09 time frame. That was scary. The bond market, the worst calendar year performance was 2%. But we also had in 08 and 09 a period of time where bonds over a 12-month period were down 27%. So yes, there are times when the market is not going to perform, whether it be stocks or bonds. But the reality is that there are opportunities to buy. And that's how we have to think about it. And I'll, I'll I'll make a couple comments of that here in a minute. Mutual funds are a great way to invest. Um, they started back in the 1920s. A company called Mass Financial Services started the first uh, mutual fund. And what they did is they said, you know, there's people that can't afford to buy stocks. GE was the, was the number one selling stock back in that time. And, and GE was, was quite expensive. Nobody could buy a share of it. So, Mass Financial Services, MFS, as they're known today, said, let's, let's go out and create fractional ownership of stocks. Let's let people put in 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, and, and, and we'll sell them a small percentage of a share, and we'll track it. And, and if it goes up, they'll have more money. If it goes down, they'll lose money, just like investing in stocks, but we'll just let people do it at smaller amounts of money. And it really changed investing. For people like us in this room today, it gave us an opportunity to invest and, and, and to be part of that process. Um, there's this long time argument, active versus passive. Uh, you read about it sometimes. Um, by and large, it doesn't matter. Uh, I can show you examples of active funds that have done very well. I can show you passive that have done very well. The difference is the ride that you want. Okay, so, so I, kind of, I, I kind of like the analogy of, of, of let's go to Lagoon. Do you want to ride Colossus? You're going to be, you know, or, or Cliffhanger, and you're going to be upside down and backwards, and, and it's exciting, and, 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 and you get this euphoria and this great rush of excitement? Or do you want to ride just kind of the putt-putt ride, the little gondola that takes you back and forth? It's easy, and... You, 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 you dropped your shave ice on people's head below you, and you know you kind of laugh at that when you were a kid. And oh, did they see me? It depends on the ride that you want. The end result's going to get you about the same. You're not going to see a lot of difference in the end result between active and passive. The active is going to cost you a little bit more. There's going to be a little bit more of a fee, but you're going to have a, a you're going to have an easier, steady ride. You're not going to be as nervous about it. The passive, there's no management. It's going to go up, it's going to go down, it's going to be wild, but the end result's probably going to be very similar. But if you're somebody that can't stomach those ups and downs, if you, if you just want to have a real simple, easy going ride, well, then active might be the way to go and, and, and uh, you'll pay a little bit more for it, no problem. You'll get, you'll get to the same result at the end. But, but I think there's too much discussion about active versus passive. I don't think it really makes that much difference. I haven't seen it. I've been in this 18 years. I haven't seen that much difference. Um, prospectus is an important thing to understand. Every time you buy a mutual fund, the prospectus will give you detail about that fund. And it'll tell you what that fund buys and what, how much percentage can be in certain investments and, and what their parameters are. It'll tell you what their fees are. And, and so that's a, an important thing to read and understand. The potential advantages you get from mutual funds are that, number one, you get diversification. Um, if you go out today and say, I'm going to put $100 into one stock, let's say that you want to buy Google. Great. You buy Google, and Google's doing fine. But then two years from now, the U.S. government comes in and does what China does and says, we're going to limit Google. 
Google's too powerful. We've, we've forgotten in our, in, in, in our day what governments can do to companies. Back in 1909, I think this is interesting, Standard Oil Company of New York, the original Sony, was broken up because they were too big. They were a hundredth of the size of Google today. And they were in the oil business. Today we have Google in the information business. Google can control what we see on our computers. They can control what advertisements we see because we click on one thing and, and something else shows up five minutes later. And they're a hundred times bigger than Standard Oil of New York was when they got broken up. So is a day coming when Google's gonna get broken up? I don't know, I'm not saying there is or isn't, I'm not saying they should or shouldn't be. I'm just saying that things can change in our world and all of a sudden Google stock may not be as valuable as it was. But if you have a diversified pool of, of stocks inside of a mutual fund and the government shuts Google down, it doesn't have as much effect as if you, in, in that one fund as if you owned just Google. So that's the benefit of mutual fund investing. You get built-in diversification, you get some protection, uh, from the downside, you get a little bit steadier ride, typically. There's risk. Investing in, involves risk. You see that all the time. Fidelity advertises on TV, Vanguard, Franklin, Templeton, American funds. Investing involves risk. But if you can build a portfolio that, that allows for different types of, 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 of investments and different kinds of money in different places, you can mitigate most of your risk. One of the things that we do at Allegis, and, and you can visit with one of our representatives and they can help you understand this, we have what we call a bucket strategy. And the bucket strategy is built specifically to help you maximize dollars that you want at risk and use other dollars to mitigate those risks so that in a period of time when you need to take a withdrawal, you, you don't have to take a withdrawal in a down market. And, and that's a very important strategy and it's something that, that just doesn't get done enough. Too many times people pull all of their money into one place and then you're at the mercy of, of what that account does based on market performance. We like, to, we like to use different tools, different vehicles, leverage those tools and vehicles against one another to mitigate your risk but yet still give you the highest return that you can get for, the, for that particular bucket of money. So, so it's important to understand that there is risk there. Um, foreign risk is something that comes up all the time. Uh, in my view today, this is my own personal opinion, um, and, and, and I manage about $50 million for, for my clients. I, I, I look at the market today, and if someone were to say, where's the most risk in the market? I would tell them that the most risk is here in the US because our, our market is high. We've seen an incredible run up over the last eight years. Internationally, we've, we're, we're trailing. So if you're looking for a place where you can put money and, and buy at a discount, potentially that's overseas. And, but yet people hear, oh my gosh, invest overseas? Oh, that's risky. Well, not really. If you believe in the principle of buy low and sell high, opposite of my old man, then overseas is probably a good thing to consider right now. Um, it, 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 it might be something to, to take a look at. Stock fund investing, you have growth value and sector funds. We're typically not a big fan of sector funds because you tend to pool your risk. For example, uh, financials. Uh, the financial industry back in 07, 08, 09 got destroyed. And if you were a sector investing in financials, you lost a lot of money, more than you would have lost had you just been in an index. Um, we typically like to blend out between value and growth because there's upside in both of those. And there's also some downside protection in value. So we think that, that, that a blended approach typically works the best. Bond investing uh, is a great way to, to diversify your portfolio. Think about it this way, stocks, uh, if you think about stock investing, that's ownership. If you own a stock of Google, if you have one share of Google, you own part of Google, it's kind of cool. Or if you own a, a share of Micron or, or uh, a share of, uh, of Amazon, you own a, a piece of that company. If you have a bond, now you're in loanership. A bond is different. A bond says, I went out to Google and said, hey, Google, I'm going to give you $1,000 for your bond. You're going to pay me back 4% every year for 10 years. And at the end of the 10 years, you're going to give me back my $1,000.
Um, right now in, in, in the United States, Ford Motor Company is issuing a lot of bonds. They, uh, um, they're, they're doing a lot of things to, to, uh, to, to, to grow and, and develop. And so they're, they're, they're basically becoming, they're like a bank. You go to Ford Motor Company, you buy a, a, a bond, they pay you back, and at the end of 10 years, they're going to give you your principal back. Bond investing can be a great thing. There are bond mutual funds just like there are stock mutual funds where managers will go out and they'll pull up a group of bonds, and then you can buy that bond fund, and, and then they'll, they'll pay you some interest uh, for owning that, that fund. But bonds are a great diversifier. If you are closer to retirement, bonds are good because they provide income. There's a dividend that comes from those bonds every month. And so that can help you to, to supplement your retirement income. Global investing, we talked about that a little bit. There's a lot of opportunity that way. Um, the, uh, the, the foreign markets have grown incredibly. We're to the point now where there's just about as much commerce outside the United States as there is in the United States. And so that's why global investing has become more important. Um, we'll skip through that. I don't think that's terribly relative. Asset allocation, um, this, is, this is really where you get into how do you invest? What should I buy? Where should I put the money when I'm, when I'm using a stock portfolio? I like this chart, it's hard to read, um, but this gives you a 20 year history of the different, the different market segments and how they have performed. What you're gonna notice here, if you just look at the colors, there really isn't any pattern there. Very difficult to, to find any sort of a pattern when you, when you look at those, different, uh, at those different sectors. You look at the foreign stocks, um, just, just to give you an example, let's look at the blue box. So the blue box is U.S. large company uh, investments. Since 2010, well, let's go to 2009, up 31%, up 15, up 4, up 14, up 32, up 14, up 5, up 6. That's a pretty good track record. The last seven years, we've been on a good run there. Let's look at foreign. So in 2009, uh, foreign was up 32. Uh, then it was up 8, then it was down 12, up 17, up 23, down 4, basically flat, and up 1. So if I'm looking for what might be something that's on sale, so to speak, maybe it is foreign stocks, just based on what's happened the last few years. It's interesting to me. Um, I'm sure that, that we have a shopper or two in the group, I'm imagining. Possibly. When you're gonna go buy something, do you wanna buy it when it's on sale? Or do you look for the ad that says, all of our prices are up 200%. <laughs> we always try to buy it when it's on sale, right? But what's interesting, but, but, but for some reason, as a society and a people, we don't treat our investments the same way. In, in 2008, um, U.S. large company stocks were down 35%. So, so that's essentially like Dillard's saying, everything in the store, 35% off the price that it was a year ago. I'm heading to Dillard's. I'm going to go buy a suit, 35% cheaper than it was a year ago. That's a good deal. I bought a suit at Dillard's last year, and that same suit today is 35% less. I'm going. I like it. But when it comes to our investing, we don't think that way. It was down, it's down 35%. I liked it a year ago when it was $100 a share. Today it's $65 a share. I should be so excited. I should do backflips, handsprings, cartwheels. I should buy as much as I can. But we, for some reason, there's a disconnect in our brain. And it's, and it's because we have a stockpile of that suit in the closet. And we're bothered because those suits now are worth less than they were a year ago. But we can't think that way because it doesn't matter the value until I need the money. What we have to do is recognize that we're all in the accumulation game. We're just trying to buy as many suits as we can, as many dresses as possible, and put them in the closet. Because someday we're going to need that dress. Someday I'm going to have to look good in that suit. Just not today. So anytime we can buy at a discount, we should do that. I relate it to gas prices. Fourth of July, 2008, 
we were in McCall, Idaho. I don't know if any of you have been, been to McCall. We love McCall. Um, and uh, over the course of seven days, I put $1,100 of gas in my boat at $5.59 a gallon. I about died. It was just insane. And in fact, the, the limit was $100 on the card, right? And one of the times I filled up, I, I put in the $100 and reset it and then put in another 90 $190 of gas in one setting. It was ridiculous. So was I excited when gas prices a few years later were down at less than $3 a gallon? Holy Hawkeye. We'll, we'll, we'll boat all month if you want, kids. Right? But we don't think about that way in stocks. And we should. Now, there's going to be a point where you're going to have to spend. You're going to have to wear the dress. You're going to have to put the suit on. If you'll position your portfolio appropriately, you'll be able to control when you do that. And you'll be able to put it on at the appropriate time when it's worth the most amount of money. And that's where using an advisor, somebody like us or, or anybody else that, that you've worked with, I shouldn't say anybody else because not everybody does it the way we do, but by creating buckets of money and an overall strategy, we can make sure that when it's time to pull the suit out of the closet, it's worth the most amount of money possible. That you'll get that dollar back or the dress, however you, however you want to term that. But winners rotate. It's important to understand that, that uh, there really is no method to the madness of the market. Three popular strategies for investing. Some people say pick the winners. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever read Money Magazine. I laugh at Money Magazine. I shouldn't. I, I don't want to be too harsh. But, but uh, Money Magazine's famous for picking the winners. This is the winner. Invest with it. Well, the reality is that the picking the winner strategy is probably the worst thing you can do. Um, if every year over the last 20 years you had said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in last year's best performing index, then you would have averaged 6.92% over the 20 years. It's not bad, but you'd have been better off to chase the loser. Whatever did the worst last year, invest in that, because what goes down is going to come back up. But really, your best choice is to just stick with an allocation strategy, find the blend that's comfortable for you, just stick with it. Don't try to get in, don't try to get out. And that strategy worked the best. Risk and reward, put them in perspective. Um, bonds are gonna give you the, 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 the least return, but they're the smallest amount of risk. Um, foreign stocks are gonna give you um, an almost an equal return over the past 20 years. An equal return to bonds, even a little bit less, but a lot more risk. Small growth stocks provide you the, the, the most risk uh, in your portfolio. Um, and, in, and then you can see the blue dot in the middle. An allocation strategy is going to give you probably the best of both worlds. A good return with, the, with a moderate amount of risk. Why invest now? History shows that time, not timing, is the key to investment success. That's uh, Sir John Templeton. He's the founder of Franklin Templeton. He, was the, he, he opened the first international mutual fund. That was the Templeton Growth Fund, and it was started by Sir John Templeton back in 1954. A lot has happened since then, but I, I love that quote. So can you afford to wait? I love this. $10,000 investments on the best and worst days. If you went in and said, you know what? I just want to invest on the best days. What would have happened to your, to, to your return over the last 20 years? You would have averaged 8.82%. Uh, if, if you had just invested on the worst days, then, you, then you'd have a return of 6.61%. So obviously, you know, being invested on those good days is important. This is the part that I love, the, the, the idea that people can time the market, right? I can get in, I can get out, I'm good at this, I know what I'm doing. This is an amazing slide. Go back 20 years, ending December 31 of 16. If you just stayed fully invested in the S&P, and again, you can't invest directly in the S&P, but in something that mirrors that, either actively or passively, you would have returned 7.68%. If you miss the 10 best days over the 20 years, just 10 days, your return drops to 4%. So that's missing the best day every other year. Let me put that in perspective. If you miss the 20 best days, so the best day every year, your return is now average of 1.58%. And if you miss the best 30 days, you're negative. So 
So when the people say, well, I can time the market. I know when to get in, get out. Boy, if, if, if you're working with an advisor that's telling you that now, I would, I, would, I would gather up your money and get out of there because they just can't do it. It doesn't work. Um, and some people say, well, what if you miss the worst days? Impossible. You don't know. You just, there's just no way to predict that. So the best thing to do is pick an allocation strategy, stick with it. The closer you get to retirement, evaluate it, and decide if it's time to get out. And we'll tell you this. Um, if, if you're within three years of retirement right now, I would be having a very serious conversation with an advisor, somebody who, who works in, in all aspects of the financial services world, to say, I'm three years away. What changes should I make to my portfolio? How do I protect what I've made over the past five, six, seven years, especially the last 18 months? Because I don't want to give it back. If you go, it, it, just to put that in perspective, if you look at um, somebody getting ready to retire, um, and, and, and let's go back to 2007. At the end of 2007, they're saying, you know what? I'm about a year away. And let's say they had $100,000. At the end of 2008, that $100,000 would have turned into about $68,000. So they'd say, well, you know what? I'm going to hold on. I'll, I'll just wait it out. It, it'll come back. By March 9th, that 68000 would have been down to about 48000 down half. Now they're saying, good grief, I guess I have to work well. They would have had to work till 2011 to catch up. So instead of retiring in a year, they went another four years because they, 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 they didn't capture what, what was in front of them at that point in time. So the advice that I've always given my clients is if you're with it, once you get to within three years of retirement, we've got to look really, really closely at your overall allocation and make sure that we capture what we can, lock that money up, make sure it's protected. Let's not give back what you've made. Because once you get to that point, if, you, if, if you're 62 today thinking, eh, maybe a year or two, if the market were to drop 30% and your 100 turned into 70 or your 200 turned into 140, or your 500 turned into 350, all of a sudden you're going, hmm, I gotta work a little while longer. Now you may not retire till 67 or 68, and you may be missing some important years where your health's still good and those kind of things. So I think you really have to think through that. Make sure that if you're within three years that you're starting to make some important decisions. Dollar cost averaging, uh, if you're participating in, 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 in monthly contribution, you're doing that. I think this is a critical piece. It's the only thing we can control. The only thing we can control in our investing world is our average price that we pay for the investment. That's it. Everything else is going to happen because it's going to happen. People are going to fly planes into buildings. People are going to burn flags. Stock, companies are going to go out of business. CEOs are going to get fired. Those things are going to happen regardless. We can't change it. The only thing we can do is, is affect when we buy, how much we buy, drive your, your, your average purchase price as low as possible. Um, impact of starting early, we've talked about that. The earlier, the better. Uh, time is your best friend when investing. Let time work. Time works all the time. When you go to bed at night, your investments are still working for you or against you. If you're paying interest, you're still paying it when you're asleep. If you're earning it, you're still earning it while you're asleep. So let time be your best friend. So why invest? because you're gonna need that money at some point in the future. Um, we've talked a little bit about the investment ba basics. We've talked about asset allocation. Um, that's basically the end of the presentation. I've got two points to make. Uh, and then uh, if, if you have some questions, I'll take those. Um, I, you know, we talked a little bit about this gas price thing. I think that's a really critical piece for people to recognize. Um, the idea that, that when something goes on sale, Take advantage of it. Look for opportunities like that. In today's market, um, if you're looking for opportunities, the best opportunity probably exists foreign in, in your foreign markets um, because that's where you're still buying at a discount. Um, if, if you're within three years, I would really encourage you to get with somebody who can kind of coach you to say, let's, let's, let's really look at positioning some of these assets so that we don't lose them. Uh, protect what you have. Um, all of you are public employees. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of public employees don't realize the great benefit that comes from working in the public sector as it comes to retirement planning. You've got pensions. Uh, you, you've got 401k with match. You really have some good opportunities to put money away. 
And, uh, and, and so, you know, for you, the real question is going to be just to organize what you have and uh, work with a professional that can guide you through some of those processes. Um, you shouldn't take that decision lightly. Um, you, you know, the, 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 there are a lot of people out there that, uh, that, are, that are good at what we do, but unfortunately there's also a few that, you know, should, should probably be in the circus because they're more of a clown than anything. And, and I think it's critical for you to you know, do your homework on your advisor, find out you know, what are their credentials, get some references, talk to people that have worked with them, and, uh, and make sure that this is somebody that really can work in a comprehensive approach for what you're trying to do. Um, there are certain firms that they only want to deal with uh, your, your investment side. They only want to deal with your mutual funds or maybe manage money. There's other groups that they only want to deal in fixed products. They want to deal with life insurance or annuities. We're a group that likes to work in all of those things. And so we don't have a bias to it. We're going to bring to the table different products, different solutions, different options that, that then help you make a choice. And we're going to bring it all to the table, not, well, don't do that because we can't do it. We're going to bring it all and let you make a choice. And I think that's, a, I think that's an important uh, thing to consider as you're choosing an advisor. Um, that's all I have today in the presentation. Uh, question in the back. Awesome question. I'll restate that a little bit just so we have it recorded well. Um, the question was, um, know somebody that retired, stock market dropped, they had to continue to spend to meet their income needs, um, and now they've had to go back to work because they couldn't recover. Did I summarize that well enough? That's a great question. Um, it's something that we deal with. At Allegis, we have a, a strategy that we refer to as our bucket strategy. And what we do is we separate your money into, into different buckets so that each bucket has leverage against another one. What we try to do is make sure that when you get to retirement that you never have to spend money at a discounted dollar, right? So again, let's go back to the 2008 experience. If you retired in 2008 and had to take money to live, you were spending a, you were spending a dollar and getting 65 cents back for that dollar in that period of time. That's just bad math, right? I mean, that, that, that's like going in and buying a gallon of milk, paying for a gallon, and on the way out, the store manager comes and says, oh, sorry, 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 I, I, I can, you only get a half gallon. It's the same line of thinking, right? We would never do that, right? Or going to, to, you know, to get an ice cream cone and paying for two scoops, and on the way out, oh, sorry, give us that top scoop back. But that was, that, that was the cookies and cream. That was my favorite. Well, it doesn't matter, right? Because, because the, the, the way the market is, we can only give you one scoop for the price of two. If you're spending that way in retirement, you're going to run out of money fast, and you are going to end up back at work. And it happened a lot. There's a lot of people that work at Walmart, that work at Target, that work at Kohl's, and they're 65 years old, and they were retired at one point, or they're 70. But because they didn't compartmentalize, they didn't create buckets, they didn't have a place to go. What we like to do when you retire is we want to have a bucket of money that is at, at no risk. It cannot go down. No matter what happens, it's not going to lose value. And in fact, even in the worst conditions, it'll still make probably one to one and a half percent. And in some years, it'll make as much as four to four and a half percent. But that money is always there safe, and you can go pull that money out in a down market year to let the market heal. Now, the other thing that we believe in is dividends. And this isn't part of the presentation here, but I'll just give you a quick synopsis on dividends. Um, the best way I can relate it to you is, is I want you to visualize that you are a landlord and you have a small house that you rent out, three bedroom, two bath, and uh, you, you collect $1,000 a month on that house. That, the, the value of the house is irrelevant, whether it's worth 100000 or 200000 because what's important to you is the $1,000 a month that's being generated from the, from, from the rent, correct? 
And, and so what we want to do when you get into retirement is we want to implement a dividend strategy. We want you to put money into an account that will pay you a dividend every month. Now you're living on the dividend. Now it doesn't matter if the value goes up. If, if, if let's take Franklin Income Fund, for example. If Franklin Income Fund is, is, is worth, if, 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 you're, if you're holding in Franklin Income Fund, it's worth $100,000, and it's paying $416 a month in a dividend, it doesn't matter if the 100 goes to 110 or drops to 90. It's still paying you $416 a month in a dividend. You can live on that. That's, that can supplement your income. And if you want to sell Franklin Income Fund, you can, but you wait until it's worth $110,000 or $120,000. In the meantime, it's still paying you the $416 each month. And, and that's the important thing to note. Oh. Sorry. That's the important thing to note about um, dividend investing is those dividends will be there. And so that's the other bucket that we like to create is the idea of being able to have money for you in retirement that continues to pay you at regards of the ups and downs of the market. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Typically, we like three, sometimes four. Um, the three buckets are, are real simple. They're not based on product. They're based on, on, on just overall the loss of what the money's going to do. The first thing you have to have is a guaranteed income bucket. Your pension that you're going to have through the Utah Public Employee Retirement System fits in that bucket. That's a great bucket, by the way. We'd love that. Social Security. Some of you are going to have more Social Security than others. But Social Security, by and large, is, it fits into that guaranteed income bucket. It's consistent. It shows up every month. The, uh, um, the next bucket we focus on is your liquid bucket. We always have to have a place to go that we can get money out that when we need it, it's there and available. When the market is doing well, we can pull it out, and we like it to be dividend-based because we know those dividends are going to be consistent. The third one is your guaranteed bucket. This is the place that we go to make sure that, hey, we know that no matter what happens in the world, that piece is always safe. I can always go get money out of that bucket, and I won't have to spend it at a discount. I may spend a dollar and only get a dollar three back, but at least I got more than a dollar. Never do we want you to be in a situation where you have to go spend a dollar and only get 65 or 70 cents back. And I, and I realize that sounds kind of simple in a way, but yet complicated in another. But I can tell you that very, very few advisors use that system. And it's just crazy to me. Because when you can create that for people, you, you, you really can become almost bulletproof to the market. Because there's just nothing that's going to, you, you've got a place to go where you can get money and not have to spend it at, at a discount. Great questions. Yes, sir. What would you take on, on uh, precious metals, your gold? Uh, Love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That question comes up a lot. Um, yes, thank you. Um, the question was, how do I feel about gold and precious metals? Um, a couple of things to consider. Number one, none of them are dividend payers. So they're definitely a buy and hold proposition. Um, the, uh, the, the problem that you tend to have is, is that those things are very cyclical. Um, and, and you really do have to time you know, what, what you do there. There is a lack of liquidity in, in those things, um, especially now, you know, in Salt Lake, you probably have some opportunity that you can sell that a little bit more readily. But, it, but in small towns, it's hard to sell gold because um, a lot of places have a limit on how much they'll buy in any given day. Um, same thing with silver. If I were buying precious metals today, again, this is my personal opinion. Um, this, this is by no means the opinions of, of One America or, or the company that I represent. But if I were going to buy precious metals today, I would probably buy a little bit of silver because silver has a, a, a more wide range of use than gold does. Um, and uh, people buy gold simply because they just, you know, they want the, the, the idea of protection against the loss of the dollar. Silver gets bought because it, it, it's, it's used in a lot of things, right? I mean, you know, right here, right? I mean, th those kind of things, the, 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 the technologies of today, they need silver. Sorry. going to put that on vibrant. There we go. Um, 
So, um, yeah, I, that's probably the best information I can give you. It's a good question. comes up a lot. Seen big swings in gold. Boy, you know, you go back over the last 15 years, you know, it was clear down into the low 300s, got up over 2,000. And it got back down to close to 1,000. Now it's come back up a little bit. Um, boy, that's, that's, that, to me, that's just a bumpy ride. Man, I... Right. Yeah. Your your biggest issue there is storage and safety. Um, you know, you, you, it's just not easy to store that stuff. You know, you got to have a safe, um, and 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 you know, you you got to know how to get into the safe, and someone's got to know how to get in the safe. I mean, there's just there's those kind of things that that, that come up, and you, you know, that, that's 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 the biggest issue with that. I actually had a client that lived up in McCall at one point, had a million dollars of gold Krugerrand coin. And it literally was stored on their property, on their 100 acres, in five different vaults in the ground. And there was a map that showed you how to get there. I'm not kidding. And they, they finally sold it all off over a period of about four years. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just thought, man, that's crazy. If they died and that map burned up, can you imagine that? 100 years from now, somebody be digging and find this vault. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's crazy. Yes? Yeah, great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, whole life insurance gets a bad rap, and sometimes rightfully so, because you get people that people that are in our, our business. The question is, what's the advantage of, of whole life insurance? Is there an advantage to it? Um, I'm of the opinion that everybody should own a small whole life policy. At, at least a, a small whole life policy. Um, I, I know Dave Ramsey's out there telling everybody buy term, invest the difference, and never own whole life. Um, I, I just, I simply think Dave's wrong on that issue. Now, I'm not saying that you should have a huge whole life policy, and I'm not saying that you should pay huge premiums, but I've just learned in the real world of investing that, that um, people, when, when, when people die, it's expensive. If you had, if, 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 you've, if you've ever had somebody that died that died of cancer, um, those final six to eight to 10 weeks of their life are expensive. You're putting a lot of money out for, for, for medical care, heroic medicine in some cases, you're trying everything you can do. Um, and and those, so there's costs incurred there. If all of your money is in a retirement account and you have to pay those bills out of a retirement account, you're gonna pay those bills and you're going to pay taxes on the withdrawal on those bills because you took it out of a retirement account. The retirement people don't care what, what reason you spent the money. They just know that you spent the money. And, and so you're going to pay taxes on that. Having a whole life insurance policy, something that you know is going to be enforced when you die, is going to, is going to help reimburse some of those costs. The other issue that you have that people don't think about is when, when, when you're married, Two, uh, two people, 65 years old, that filed Social Security. Um, one of them was earning more than the other. Um, so let's take person A, and their Social Security is $1,500 a month, and person B's is 750 a month. Doesn't matter who dies, the lowest Social Security is going away. So that's a big change, right? That's a $750 loss of income. But typically, the expenses don't go down $750. So I think it's a good idea to have some, some insurance in place at death to help re replace that Social Security that was lost on that death. Additionally, you could have pension losses. Around here, there's a lot of people that work for the feds. And, and there's a lot of people that, that when they take the federal pension, they take the highest payout, which is the lowest payout for the spouse. Having some life insurance may be a good idea to replace that potential loss of, of, of income from the pension. Again, I think it goes back to work with an advisor that can do all those things. Listen, I'm not here to tell you that everybody should go out and buy a huge whole life policy tomorrow. Not what I'm saying at all. But I personally own it. I have some on my wife. Uh, and, and, and I think long term there's great value in having a policy that, that not only will provide benefit at death, but it also becomes a, an accumulation tool for me 
as I'm working through my, my working years and I'm getting the kids through college, it becomes a safety net. That cash that's there, I can use that cash and, and it becomes a benefit while I'm living as well. So I think, I think there's some value in, in whole life. I also think there's value in term insurance. I think as a, generally speaking, um, most people are underinsured. Um, you know, again, inflation, right? I mean, I inflation has had a major impact. Uh, on, on, on the spending dollar. And, and if, if you have a death and, and you lose income, um, boy, having some term insurance that replace that is going to be pretty important, uh, I, I think. That, does that help? Yeah, they do. Yeah, I, I think um, the comment was that, that, you know, insurance in the workplace can be a good thing, but if you lose the job um, voluntarily or involuntarily, those costs can go up. I'll tell you another just planning philosophy that I have with, with my clients. I, I have a very active practice. I have about 400 clients uh, manage in the market about 50 million and then, and then in, in fixed money, probably another 100 million. Um, and... Uh, one of the main philosophies that I have when I first sit down with people is to say, look, whatever your employer gives you for life insurance, I want you to take whatever they give you for free. Any other life insurance that you're going to have, you're going to pay for it out of your checking account. You're going to be control of it. You're, we're going to know that it gets paid. We're going to know who the beneficiary is. We're going to know where that policy is held so that if there is a death, we can file that claim quickly and seamlessly. Um, and, and, and do it with, with, with a minimal amount of intrusion. Um, I, I like my clients to own their life insurance individually um, and, and not do it through the employer because you're right, things change. I, I quit my job, I lose my job, and now all of a sudden I'm out of income, plus I've lost my benefit package. So I've got to go back and, and retool. And, and if for whatever reason you've become uninsurable or you've put on a little bit of weight or you're not as insurable as you were earlier, now you, end up, you could end up paying more for that insurance. Uh, I, I like people to just be in control of that part of their plan. So does that mean that plan, you can actually, you earn money from it? Is that how it works? What kind of plan are you referring to? Oh yeah, yeah, in a whole life plan. So for example, um, uh, the question was, you know, does a whole life policy actually grow for you? Yes, it does. Um, my wife's policy, I just got this report, so I, I, this is an easy number. Her cash value last year um, grew uh, by 5.12%, um, not including the money that I put in, in premium. So I look at that and I say, good grief. Where can I go today and get a 5% return on the money with no risk, tax deferred, and if I wanted to pull that money out, I could pull it out tax-free at 5%. That's a really good return. Um, now, the first couple of years, the return wasn't that good because there's costs associated with it. Um, you know, obviously, I'm the agent, so I, I got paid to write it. Uh, there's a cost of underwriting that goes into it. State of Idaho charges a premium tax. That comes out. But, but once you get past that second year, you start to see growth there. And um, we, we, that, that's, that, that's been a great thing for us. I, I love those. I, I get that statement every year, and it's pretty exciting. In 2009, um, we, uh, the market was down, and we had some money invested in Franklin Templeton. And we decided to make a fairly major purchase. And, and I didn't want to use my, my money that was in the market because it was down in value. So I went out and just took a withdrawal out of my whole life policy and my wife's whole life policy. Not a loan. We just took a withdrawal. And we used that to pay for this purchase. And... Uh, and, and, and then we just let the, you know, let, let the market uh, come back. And in 2012, when the market had recovered, then we went in and we put that money back in. I was able to do a catch-up uh, with the company and, and add in some additional money back into the life policy. And I used that money out of Franklin that had come back in value. And so that's kind of that, that back-and-forth effect that I'm talking about that you can create if you're smart. You can create that, and, and it really can become a, a, a really good way to manage your money. Yeah, good questions. Other questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am.
Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really true. Um, so the question, uh, repeating it, was, you know, the importance of the advisor relative to the importance of the company. Um, I think that's critical. You know, the, there's there's a couple of Edward Jones guys up in Boise that where I live that really do a nice job. Uh, there's a couple of that, that Edward Jones people that, you know, I, I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. Um, it's 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 the nature of of, of people, right? Um, Edward Jones as a company is great, um, got a good reputation, but not everybody that works for Edward Jones is equal. Uh, and so I think it's important that when you're going through this process of, of looking at your advisor, number one, are they comprehensive? Can they do everything that you need done? Um, number two, uh, do some comparing. You know, what, what, what are they suggesting? Ask them about a, a bucket strategy. How would they build a bucket strategy for you? What would that look like? Then go out and compare that. Um, number three, is your advisor willing to bring safe, no risk uh, products to the table? Uh, there's a lot of them that just won't do it. And, and the reason is pretty simple. Um, a lot of the firms, uh, the, the larger firms get paid having your money in their accounts, they're getting paid on that every year as long as that money's there. Um, when you take products out and put them into these safe, fixed products, then you're, th that money's no longer recurring income to that advisor. He's going to get paid once, and that's it. He doesn't get paid anymore. Um, and, and in my practice, I have probably 80 to, a million, 80 to $100 million in those kind of products that, that I don't get paid on. But it's the right thing for the client because it's that's that safe money. That's that place that we know is never going to go down in value. You, you're going to be able to go get that at any point in time. There's a percentage of that available to you. No fee, no penalty, no charge. And a lot of advisors don't want to do that because they don't want to take that money off the recurring stream, right? Uh, but I think that's a critical piece. You, you, you got to find an advisor that's willing to do that for you because you need that, especially as you get older. Now, you know, how old are you? 27? You don't, need fixed, you don't need fixed money in your account. You should be as aggressive as you want. Just let it run. It's going to work. Don't panic when it goes down. Buy more. Um, that's another suit in the closet, right? Uh, just let it go. Um, but, you know, somebody that's, you know, a little bit older, that's where you've got to start to think a little bit more closely about some of those fixed dollars and, and, and some of the safety that's available. I think once a year is probably pretty ac adequate. Um, I think it depends on, you know, are your needs changing? You know, are, are you getting to the point where, you know, maybe you're starting to think about some life changes, you know, retirement or, or uh, you know, may, maybe helping grandkids with, with some expenses or whatever that is. Um, I think that's where you have to start to decide, you know, again, repeating the question was how often to meet. Um, annually is probably okay. Um, but you know what other what other things are happening along the way? You know, are are, are you invited to educational type events? Um, you know, are you are you getting you know email updates on things that are happening in the market? Um, some of those kind of things. You know, if if not, then you know may, maybe you should consider you know a, a change. Good questions. Okay. Anything else? Thank you for coming. Hopefully it was helpful. Uh, got a couple of handouts for you. Um, we have, uh, did we get a sign-up sheet around, Jordan? I believe so. Got that. We have 